So it's a particularly tough job, therefore, uh, that Charlotte Fowler and Professor Phil Blower have in, preventing, in presenting the highlights lecture to us. Both of them know, need no introduction. Charlotte, as you would have heard before, has taken the reins of the MSc in, at King's and has secured the future of it. She has acted as a mentor to many of us here, including myself, and she's also chair of the SAC. So it's great pleasure to introduce Charlotte. Phil also is our worthy recipient of the Norman Veal Prize yesterday. For those of you that can still remember that after the after-party events of last night. He's a chair of imaging chemistry at KCL and have, has over 200 published papers. And again, like Charlotte, has mentored many of us with over 33 uh, PhD students. So it's great pleasure that I invite them to the stage and first Charlotte. Thank you so much. Um, what an honor and what a difficult uh, job it is uh, to do this, I have to say. Uh, Phil um, has given me instructions. He has to catch a train in about 20 minutes or something. So I'm gonna shoot through this because it's very difficult. But is, hasn't it been wonderful for me, the highlight of the meeting has been just laying eyes on people. It's been so great, hasn't it? So my first highlights are just to reflect the fact that, you know, we have been together, spent some time together, and um, had a great time. So that is, that's me done. Yes. <laughs> but thank you so much to the BNMS, um, and uh, thank you for the honor of being asked to, to present here today. Um, we had a strange, uh, <laughs> Phil and I heard that I am the Kate to his will, so this is as good as we can get. Uh, both have slightly unruly uh, au natural hair, um, but anyway, thank you, Vineet and Brent, for putting together such a fabulous program. I think you'll agree with me. I think we should give them a clap, actually, for what was just absolutely amazing. So we've had uh, 55 expert talks and 99 uh, submissions. How on earth to summarize them? So, you know, I like to think I'm a bit of a scientist. I like to categorize things. So I started with geography. So this is the distribution of our invited speakers, the list on the right, and uh, the geography of the um, submissions. And you can see that the strong players were London and Glasgow. Um, so well done, the whole te home team here. It's been brilliant. Then I thought we could look at it and from a path pathological perspective. And of course, the winner here, no surprises, um, is uh, prostate cancer. And that in a large part is due to PSMA. Um, but you can see that it's kind of slightly unrewarding uh, way of going through um, looking at the different talks. But just to say that um, Sentinel nodes did get in there, so they had one talk, but um, you can see we're fairly evenly spread across the others. So then I thought, oh, I know what I'll do is I'll, um, I'll split it by the professional group. Not a chance of being able to do that because it's just impossible to unpick the interwoven roles that we all play. And it's part of the theme of this, which is that we are all, you know, part of the same process. We keep on talking about workforce, and I will, you'll be surprised to hear, come back to that. Um, but we just need to um, recognize that actually we're all playing our parts within the team, and it's impossible for me to have unpicked the, the roles. So then I thought, okay, I'll see if I can work it out from a kind of innovation to guideline range. So I would go through and I would see whether papers were innovative and if they were, whether that was due to radiopharmaceuticals or hardware or IT development. And then looking at the kind of implementation and optimization. So I've done that going through um, PET and single photon and then through um, therapies onto guidelines and systems education. So I'm not gonna be talking, you'll be, devastated to hear about every single um, talk that has been given this uh, week, this week, but every one of them is represented by a little colorful line there. So you can see that what we have is a very healthy bulge 
are here, which is the radiopharmaceutical development. And the next one along is the hardware. Next one along is the software, the IT changes. This is optimization and implementation of PET. And same for SPECT. Here's therapy. Coming up behind is guidelines and outcomes. And then the last one is systems, education, and workforce. So I'm just going to try not to take too long over it, just to give you a few um, sort of uh, small in moments. These are just my, my personal highlights. Um, so first of all, the hardware. Just to say, today is the 18th of May. And so although we celebrated um, the 30th anniversary with some very fine cakes yesterday, today is the day. Um, first uh, clinical pet in the UK was done 30 years ago today on the 18th of May. And um, there's the picture of um, Mike Maisie um, and the first patient having their cardiac scan on the uh, St. Thomas's PET scanner. So we were very lucky, weren't we, to have a great talk um, regarding total body PET CT, image better, image faster, low dose, longer, later, total body coverage. I mean, it's the holy grail, isn't it? And um, I'm sure that we're all going to be able to um, afford these. I mean, when I started, um, when I left medical school and was wandering around the wards, um, you know, people were talking about these ridiculously expensive MRI scanners, and they're all over the NHS like a rash now, so I don't see why we can't be ambitious and positive. So fast imaging, low-dose imaging, high-quality imaging, and um, of course this fantastic um, image data set um, for paediatrics with very low um, radiation doses of 0.04 uh, millisieverts for this end um, data set here which is double that of a chest x-ray. So I think it's pretty remarkable, isn't it? We then looked at some um, whole body uh, CZT, spec CT, um, and the advances that that has made, and also some um, imaging uh, improvements that have been done by deviceless uh, respiratory gating, and the improvements in image um, acquisition that can be done by that. Moving on then to the IT side of things, this is all a little bit too much for my pea-sized brain. I can just about work out what filter back projection is and, um, you know, pretend I understand iterative reconstruction. But this is a little bit beyond me, I'm afraid, but I'm very excited by it. Um, semantic features, agnostic features, it sounds a little bit kind of theological to me. But anyway, um, thank goodness there are people who have very big brains who are able to help us in this way, and I'm sure it's going to be the way of the future. So we've got AI, basic terminology, deep learning, and how that can improve our um, pet uh, reconstruction. So here we have my, my familiar stamping ground. Let me get that to work. Can't get it to work. Um, but filter back projection in the middle, it should reconstruction then, and then deep pet learning. So. I think I can see what it does, even if I haven't got a chance of understanding it. On to then um, optimization and implementation of PET. So just congratulations to everybody getting um, their PSMA services off the ground. And here's just an example of one from the local team. Well done. Um, and we had a great talk from Ravi Kumar on the, um, from Australia. What a pleasure that was to hear that, um, talking about um, the the projects in Australia and giving us some um, really good insights, I think, into how important it is that we have, uh, you know, really structured, well-funded research so that actually our dreams, the concept that come up in a meeting like this, um, actually come to fruition and patients get their care. And of course, um, sharing of unusual findings. So this is... Um, a nice uh, case from uh, this series from UCL showing just this isolated peritoneal disease and prostate cancer. So unusual findings. Um, it's great to see that. Very good to hear from um, Professor Barrington um, about uh, pet care in lymphoma. 
and how that can optimize patient care. I'll just go back to that. If it's pet positive, you can es escalate. If it's pet negative, slow down, reduce the toxicity, and we can help our patients get triage to the right group. Then on to single photon optimization and implementation. So we've already seen the CZT um, camera, which is um, very exciting. But one of the things that really has struck me really quite recently, it seems only a few years ago that we were talking about this to start off with, how on earth have we got to the stage where amyloid, cardiac amyloid scan is part of our routine daily practice? And it's happened so quickly, hasn't it? I really am just filled with admiration that we've actually managed as a community to go from the concept, I mean, I know it was an established um, tracer, so they didn't have to go through any of that, but to actually get to the stage where clinicians are asking for this and where we go, oh yeah, sure, cardiac amyloid scan, no problem at all, very straightforward imaging, got a decent tracer, got the pathophysiology understood, Bob's your uncle. And, um, you know, we should really learn from this, I think, and apply it elsewhere. The time frame between their research and the clinical rollout has been extraordinarily short. Um, and we need, I think that the reason why it really worked is because clinicians were involved in the team. And so they roll out to their conferences. We have to be a little bit careful about presenting all of this stuff to each other within this group um, and uh, not involving our um, clinical colleagues enough. We would need our work to be embedded into their clinical pathways because we can't make referrals to ourselves. Um, so some great uh, looking stuff from the Royal Free and um, quantification. Um, we have to be so careful when we put numbers on things, don't we? Numbers are so magic, and it's one of the real advantages. When I talk to radiologists and say, come and do nuclear medicine, we put numbers on things, and everyone goes, wow, numbers. And we have to really make sure those numbers are right, don't we? And we have to be careful with how our data sets are processed before we apply the quantification. And so the more we... Um, are really careful with that. The more phantom work we do to we can be really confident that our, our numbers are correct, the better. On to um, optimization and implementation of therapy. So we had a fantastic talk from Val. Isn't she a star? Um, she took us through all the history and showed us that we need to worry about our workforce and our manpower shortage, and how important it is that we're in a good place to respond to what basically is big business now. And of course, we then went on to the guidelines, and thank you to Sabina for summarizing those so beautifully for us. The guidelines were written, you know, only very recently by just a few people, and then suddenly there were great teams of people working on these guidelines because of the mushrooming of the applications of um, PET, and it's been great to see that. But of course, the elephant in the room um, is, are we going to be ready for PSMA therapy? It's going to be nice guidance uh, approved very soon, and um, how are we going to get geared up for this? So we need to always come back to uh, clinical impact on outcomes. How frequently do our tests influence management? I have to say that we don't have many posters or presentations on that because I included those um, papers in this sort of category. There actually aren't that many where we actually say, you apply this test and this is how much difference it makes to this patient. And I think that we could all be doing with um, engage, I would like just to appeal to the audience to say, let's get some more of those kind of papers next year. Be more proactive, deal with your clinical teams so that um, they feel more comfortable with us and are able to engage with our processes more actively. And then onto the education workforce. Now I have a bit of an interest in this, but um, of course, uh, radiographers, technologists, and nursing committee also um, have done some work and they've actually done a survey 
looking at the uh, nuclear medicine workforce in the UK, um, vacancy rate, staff expected to retire, and so on and so forth. And this is a very shocking slide. Um, just take a minute over this. So, over just over 55% of vacancies um, have not been filled after six months. We've got 21% of staff who are within five years of expected retirement. And we've got just over 30% of uh, non-UK nationals who may not be feeling quite so at home here following Brexit. So we've got a real problem, and I'm sure that your, your departments have felt like my department, which is that we have been running, you know, really quite small lists recently because there just isn't the staff to, to man the cameras. It's been very um, awful to be part of that. Um, and of course, top, top of the tree is training. So any of you who were here just before this session will have heard about the King's College London postgraduate diploma closing, um, very sad um, and difficult state of affairs. But Brighton and Sussex have come through. They are our knight in shining armor. And don't forget that this is going to be opportunities not just for the doctors amongst us, but also for the nuclear medicine uh, technologists and radiographers and nurses, because we've got um, this uh, postgraduate certificate, add three on to make it a diploma, which can be um, made more attractive depending on what group you're from. And everyone can then go on and do a master's um, if they do the research part of it as well. So um, that's about it from me. I'd like to hand over to Will. Uh, Professor Phil Blower, and um, th just to say thank you to everybody for a really marvellous um, conference. I've had such a great time. I hope that um, that was a very quick, uh, brief summary, and I hope that that didn't underrepresent everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Charlotte. That was fantastic. Before you disappear. I will take the opportunity on behalf of the BNMS to hand you a small token of our appreciation. Thank you, Charlotte. Thanks, Professor Blair. Thank you. So, thank you everybody who's still left for sticking around. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I've really liked about this conference, not just getting back together after two or three years, but is the increase in the amount of basic science that's been brought to the meeting for the clinicians to see, and that's what I want to focus on in my part of the presentation. Um, I've kind of structured it around themes with some very dubious links, <clears throat> but the things that are going to come out the most are total body pet and the new therapeutics, of course. So some of the stuff is about old dogs as well as new tricks. Um, and one of the old dogs is gallium citrate. And this is an example of a new application of gallium citrate, which has been around for such a long time imaging infection. This is uh, um, from uh, Bristol, um, imaging in bone infection in the base of the skull. And it's, apart from showing really nice images, um, there's always the question in the back of your mind, in, for decades now about gallium-67, is the mechanism of uptake in infection to do with in the actual infective agent itself and the siderophores they produce in order to um, recruit iron from their environment? And if that's the case, we don't know if it's the case, but if it is, we can give it a helping hand by actually produ giving, produ providing the siderophore itself uh, so the bacterium doesn't have to do it and making a gallium complex, which is isostructural with the iron complex, and it will be recognized by the microorganism and enable it to take up gallium. And we can do this with gallium-68, and that's what Maggie Cooper showed us uh, in her presentation from King's on uh, the potential to image uh, infection using gallium siderophore complexes. And she's, produced, she's shown that the, the gallium complex can bind 
to bacteria growing on stents and species specific. And she's produced a simple kit based GMP method to produce the tracer ready for a clinical trial and we hope to be reporting on that next year. Um, Indium is another old dog and we had one talk up with uh, a new, um, new application of Indium 111 in the nano drug area labeling uh, a novel type of nanoparticle which may have applications in drug delivery, graphene oxide. It's a chelator free method so we don't really know what the binding mechanism is, but it may well be applicable to other radionuclides such as zirconium-89, and then we can do PET uh, with potential applications in drug delivery and so on. And that was awarded the Young Investigator Prize, so congratulations to that group. Um, more old dogs. We've heard a bit about uh, new applications of Sestamibi, um, be bearing in mind it's, it's, um, it's not just a perfusion agent, but it is an imaging agent for mitochondrial function. And this may well be a part of its, its ability to distinguish uh, different types of renal masses uh, from um, uh, Brighton. And good old technetium colloid. We had a great presentation from Neil Thompson from Canterbury showing that you can image um, this thing called splenosis, uh, which is ectopic spleen deposits, very often as a result of trauma. Um, and Neil really liked to call, uh, like the word, splenunculus and we had a lot of practice in saying it as an audience because Neil had us in the palm of his hand uh, and it was a very entertaining lecture so I would like to give it a mention. Thanks very much Neil. Um, technetium 99, still on the subject of technetium, um, I think technetium is a neglected old dog because um, I think technetium has suffered in terms of research from the rise of PET. Um, technetium is accessible Tracer production has to be simple, as we know from 50 years of doing technetium radiopharmacy, for maximum patient access, especially nowadays as GMP demands get tougher and tougher. But the rise of PET has impoverished technetium uh, research and development because so much um, energy has been committed to PET radio tracers. And if you look at the um, bibliographic statistics on the right, you see almost no new chemistry has been published on technetium since the turn of the millennium. It's completely died away. The same happened with its thero theranostic partner, Rhenium. And you can see at the bottom the contrast with Gallium, the pet tracer, which is shot up uh, in the same period. So there's been a big shift. Um, but this is to the detriment of the nuclear medicine community, I think. Um, Technetium-99 shortages over the last 15 years or so have forced the issue and made us answer the question, do we abandon technetium and focus on PET or do we rebuild our technetium supplies? And the answer very clearly is the latter. But uh, in the meantime, nuclear medicine has moved on big time into away from the sort of functional imaging traces that were developed in the 1970s into proper molecular imaging of receptor-based uh, biological processes. And technetium chemistry has not yet adapted to that, um, this molecular imaging age, and so something must be done. And this meeting, I'm very pleased to say, something has been done. Uh, this is an example from Chandigarh in India, where they have recognized uh, the, the potential of a sialic acid derivative um, to not only to bind technetium but to bind to receptors on tumor surfaces. What I like about this is that they've done a mass spectroscopic characterization of the complex and, and have a good idea what the chemical structure is. And there, in vivo there's some evidence of tumor uptake, although we don't really know how specific that is because there haven't been any in vitro studies yet. But it's a welcome reminder of the importance of technetium and a promising basis for further evaluation. More um, new technetium and in the form of a clinical study this time, the, the, uh, an early study from Brighton on uh, a technetium version of PSMA. And this is another area where there's an awful lot of demand for PSMA imaging and it may be that PET is not able to meet that demand. Um, the images show that it works. It is able to image um, uh, metastases in, in uh, prostate cancer. And it's accessible to patients, or it will be one day, because it's technetium, but it's the cumbersome labeling process might restrict adoption in the face of regulation uh, on good manufacturing practice. And another presentation addresses that issue in this meeting. This is one of the prize-winning ones from, uh, from King's, a, a collaboration with the uh, University of Bristol, 
where they have taken this um, phosphine ligand, which is kind of similar to the, the, uh, the phosphine ligand used in MyoView, which is a, a simple kit-based preparation, and turned it into a bifunctional version, which can be conjugated to peptides. And, this, uh, and the, one of the peptides that they've looked at is PSMA. And they've uh, very thoroughly characterized the compound and shown that it does target prostate cancer in vivo. So there's a, some key outcomes here. Um, uh, another a, a point that was v added in at the end of the presentation was that it's feasible to do this also with rhenium as a, as a theranostic um, application. So we have a simple one-step synthesis. That's the really key part of this. It, may, it takes away the difficulty of, of a multi-step synthesis and makes it more feasible to do it under GMP conditions. So we have a new versatile platform for technician molecular imaging of many new targets because we can conjugate different, uh, different peptides to that. So there's two questions for the clinical community here. We have a new tier technician PSMA trace of a clinical trial. Do you want to have a go with that? And what other targets would you like to address with technetium? What molecular receptors would you like to address with technetium? So that's something for you to think about. And one of the things that is why I want to get the, the, the basic scientists in the same meeting as the clinicians so that they can begin talking to each other more effectively. So with a bit of technetium development, um, can we go from the sad state of affairs of the last 20 years to this and see a recovery um, to meet the needs of better access to radio traces for patients. Um, and of course, along with technetium development, that it's, you need to have continued development of SPECT, and I, I, this is not something that I uh, can give any great insight into, but it's, I just want to note that there's been several presentations which optimize and develop um, SPECT imaging, and so this goes hand in hand, and uh, SPECT imaging, nor technetium, are going nowhere fast. They are, they, they, they're still with us and they're gonna stay with us. Which brings me to total body pet. And of course, we had a great presentation. As usual, Ramsey was tremendously inspiring and total body pet is coming and it's going to be amazing, not just clinically, but as a research tool in human biology and medicine, investigating uh, things like systems medicine and aging processes in a way that we've never would, would have been possible with conventional pet. The UK doesn't have it yet, but we will soon. The money is being set aside by the government to do that. It will be a community resource so that everyone has a chance to get involved and come and use it and make suggestions. So we must be ready for this with methodology and new traces. I think Total Body Pet generates a need for a whole new generation of radio traces. And of course, cutting edge biological questions to ask. And there's gonna be loads of those if we use our imagination. Some of the seeds for this are being planted in this meeting, not necessarily intentionally, um, but some of the ones I would pick on are developments with very short half-life radionuclides, which could be used for tracer multiplexing. Very long half-life radionuclides could be used much more because, um, because we can image longer and use smaller doses. Imaging for advanced therapies will benefit a big time um, from this. Artificial intelligence will be needed to cope with the huge amounts of new kinds of information and improve dosimetry. So here's some examples. Uh, a nice one from UCLH um, on uh, rubidium 82 imaging, not in the heart, but in cancer. This is uh, lung tumors. And they wanted to establish whether there is more information in a, in a rubidium 82 scan of cancer than just perfusion. So they have done um, compartmental modeling and selected the most appropriate fit and it turns out to be a model with an irreversible trapping component uh, with a K3, that one, <clears throat> and that really implies that there is information in that scan on that will tell us about the trapping mechanism and probably the trapping mechanism is the activity of the sodium potassium ATPase pump. So that is a, that is a, a ubiquitous um, um, pump in all cancers, all tissues in fact, and knowing more about it will influence um, drug treatment, it will influence the ability to predict outcomes, uh, and it, being a very short half-life tracer with a, a relatively low uh, radiation dose, it could be coupled with a range of other tracers on a total body PET scanner uh, in a, in a multiplexed arrangement. So there's that, that, that wasn't the intention of this study, but, but it has set the scene and made it conceivable to do this. 
um, onto very long half-life applications. Um, so we heard um, several talks, invited talks from Jason Lewis and Serge uh, Leoshenko and Rafa Torres about how we can use long half-life radionuclides like zirconium-89 to label antibodies and to label whole cells. And in fact, Rafa's team developed um, a kit-based method to produce the, the, uh, the zirconium oxygen tracer needed to do this, and it's a simple one-step process that, that can be done under GMP conditions very readily to, to produce a tracer that is ready to radiolabel cells. And he showed uh, a number of preclinical applications. None of this has gone into the clinic yet. And one of the proffered presentations uh, from another group at King's has a, put this into practice in uh, radiolabeling natural killer cells, which are potentially a component in cancer immunotherapy. And they very thoroughly characterized what the effect of the radiolabeling process is on, on various functional attributes of the cells to make sure that when they're used in vivo, they are going to behave as they normally would. So the images are, are going to reflect the, re the behavior of the cells. And they found that the, the cells uh, in vivo could target tumors even without uh, the, uh, pre-treatment with trastuzumab, um, tr but trastuzumab treatment does enhance the tumor infiltration into the, uh, of the natural killer cells into tumors. Um, so it has to be only a matter of time before this is translated into, into human studies of cell-based therapies. Um, while just going back to the subject of antibodies for a moment, um, Michelle Mars group uh, have developed what we hope will be an improved method for radiolabeling antibodies in a more specific way with long half-life isotopes copper-64 and zirconium-89 by improving the, not, not just the site specificity, but hopefully the stability of the linkage between the chelator and the antibody to generate um, antibody conjugates that will survive longer in vivo and be able to take advantage of total body PET and image for maybe many weeks. <clears throat> Another long half-life radionuclide with growing interest is manganese-52, and uh, Veronica Rosica gave us a, a, a progress report, really, on, on the production of manganese-52 and also scandium-44, and we should have those radionuclides available uh, to collaborate with people who want to use them by the end of the year. But manganese-52 has a half-life of over five days, and so that, that pushes the, the length of time a little bit further that you can consider radio, um, imaging uh, antibodies and cells and other long, long lasting processes. Um, we also heard about vanadium 48 from the, uh, from the Cardiff and Swansea groups. Uh, vanadium 48 is interesting. It's, this is a very long half life positron emitter, 16 days. Um, so it opens up a completely new set of applications. Uh, the presentation was about the PET imaging performance, not about the production, but the production for me is what, um, is, what is interesting and will no doubt stimulate new research. And it raises a question for RSAC really, to what extent does total body PET makes, make imaging with such long half-life radionuclides feasible because of the lower doses? Um, so. Just while on the subject of, uh, it's kind of weakly linking into the subject of therapy, um, one of the not so advanced therapies is cisplatin, of course, which everybody knows about. And another presentation from King's from Fahad Al Salami has uh, investigated the hypothesis that because we suspect that, that cisplatin enters cancer cells via the same route, that is to say the CTR1, the copper transporter, as copper, maybe copper imaging with PET could predict cisplatin resistance. Um, and it's not proven, but the, the pointers are all in the right direction. Uh, as tumors become resistant to cisplatin, they lose the ability to take up copper 64. Also, providing a direct link, cisplatin inhibits copper uptake in the tumors. Uh, and this also, it all supports the hypothesis that cisplatin does enter cells through CTR1 and it offers the potential for a diagnostic test for cisplatin resistance. Um, artificial intelligence is not my bag, but it has to be mentioned because there were th several invited presentations, a whole, sec a whole session, and the potential is there to, to, uh, make, to combine with Total Body Pet to make the most of it, Gener because Total Body Pet will generate extraordinary amounts of information and new kinds of information that will need to be correlated with other information. 
uh, and artificial intelligence can, can harness that and by learning to make, to, to, to get better quality information from scans, maybe even lead to even lower radiation doses um, that would push the, push the limits of even total body PET. On the subject of doses, and I'm heading towards therapy here, but on the subject of doses, we had a nice presentation from Paul Gabe from the Royal Marsden um, on um, what, is the, what is the biggest source of uncertainty in um, dosimetry estimation for therapy, or indeed imaging, <clears throat> and it turns out that one of them, not the most, but one of the most is the fitting of the time activity curves, or getting better data uh, to, uh, to, to fit. Uh, time activity curves and of course total body PET should make a major impact on the quality of that kind of information and improve dosimetry as a result. So here we are at therapy. Um, we had several invited talks about the status quo including uh, the lovely lecture, uh, annual lecture from Val Lewington. Um, all making the same points essentially um, about supply issues, but we are at a stage where beta emitters are well established and here to stay, but we, are, we have some way to go to ensure that the skills, excuse me, and infrastructure are in place. Alpha emitters are also here, I said at least in spirit, because it's in a small scale and we have severe worries about supply issues. Um, and it's just worth noting that no therapeutic radionuclides at all are produced anywhere in the UK at the moment. And this is a precarious situation which we would like to uh, try to remedy. Same is true for Technetium 99M, of course. Uh, and OG electron emitters, we've heard a couple of presentations about them, are a gleam in the eye of researchers. And there are some quite tantalizing uh, indications that they will be very potent. Uh, and one or two companies are interested as well. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, I've already mentioned the dosimetry talk, but there's also another aspect of dosimetry and radiation protection, which is about the general use of, ray, of alpha emitters in the, in, the, uh, in the nuclear medicine departments. And there's a couple of talks which indicate that we're continuing to build a, a safety and regulatory infrastructure for alpha therapy, uh, recognizing that all the daughter components of the, of the decay chain need to be taken into account. And some of those are gases, radon, which, will have caught, which is much harder to contain and will contaminate PPA. Uh, PPE and be inhaled. So, um, again, gearing up for this new world of, of alpha emitter therapy. <clears throat> we started to hear a lot more about radiobiology uh, at last. It's been a long time coming, I think. And Inesh Costa gave us a, a really nice invited presentation about the general idea of using radiobiology in, uh, in nuclear medicine, both as a, assessing the safety, uh, the biological safety of radio tracers for imaging and improving the design of therapeutic agents. And I just want to pick one observation for, that just uh, showed its head in that talk, which tells us that <clears throat> there's an awful lot we don't know about the way radio bio, uh, radionuclides have their effect on cells. Um, uh, this one on the right shows us that technetium 99M, even technetium, good old technetium, safe radionuclide is radiotoxic if it gets into cells. That's the Auger electron effect at work. Um, so we do have to be careful about um, the safety aspects of using technetium 99M for scanning if it gets into cells. Another aspect of uh, radiobiology in one of, the invite, in one of the proffered talks was the effect of the cell cycle. We know a fair amount about the effect of the cell cycle on X-ray therapy. <clears throat> we know that cells at different stages of the cell cycle respond differently to, um, to X-rays, but what about uh, molecular radiotherapy? Um, and this presentation looked at, uh, showed us that not only is there potentially an effect in the cell's response to radiotherapy depending on the cell cycle, but also the dose is going to depend on the cell cycle because, because in different stages of the cell cycle are, are better or worse at taking up the radio pharmaceutical. So in X-ray therapy, everything gets the same dose and it's about different responses, but it's even more complicated in molecular radiotherapy because both the dose and the response will, be, will vary with the cell cycle. <clears throat> Much more work to be done there. Um, so this is um, another study from the same group uh, reported by Inesh Costa, where they have looked at the effects of Auger emitters and beta emitters in comparison by com comparing them in, a, in two cell lines which are identical except that one of them expresses the sodium iodide symporter and the other one doesn't. 
so they can control whether the radionuclides get into the cells or not. And the radionuclides they've looked at were technetium 99M, iodine 123, and rhenium 188. And this is the kind of results that we saw, and the conclusions were really quite unexpected. Technetium 99M and iodine 123, predictably, are only toxic when they're internalized. Rhenium-188, a, a high-energy beta emitter, is, is toxic when it's extracellular, but even more so when it's intracellular. The rhenium-188 was the most lethal when it's internalized on an activity per cell basis, but when you take half-life into account and do it on the basis of cumulated activity per cell, ID-123 was as potent or even more potent than rhenium-188. So the OG electron emitter can be more cytotoxic than the beta emitter, and I just need to add at the end here that there was no nuclear targeting built into this. This is a cytoplasmic uptake. So even without the nuclear targeting, the Auger electron emitter can be extremely potent. So there's a lot of things that vary from the dogma and from what's expected. So don't, ex don't accept dogma, especially in the field of radiobiology. More research on Auger electron therapy is a must. And as Val said, thinking is allowed. <clears throat> Um, so these, th these, these observations in radiobiology show us that there are a lot of things that we don't know um, that we think we know. Um, and it, it also casts doubt on the ability of dosimetry to really give us a, pre a direct predictor of biological response. And, the, and the, there's a huge amount of, uh, a whole career's worth of work needed on this subject. So alpha emitters are potent and effective. OG emitters might well turn out to be potent and effective, but where do we get them from? Is there enough to go round? And if not, where is the equality of healthcare? The answer to that currently is definitely no, especially in the UK, and it's probably especially post-Brexit. And this is obvi <coughs> excuse me, obviously is a problem for patient access, but it also creates a vicious cycle because people won't come into the field and do the research if they worry that there's not going to be an impact on patients because of a lack of the radionuclides. This will lead to a low demand from researchers, and so there'll be a poor supply, and the vicious cycle completes. So if we can break that down by improving the prospects for good availability, maybe we'll get more people working in this field. <coughs> um, Serge Lyashenko showed us uh, conveniently a nice list of the, the diagnostic and therapeutic radionuclides that we need to tool up with to, to, to go down this route. Um, but the question is, where are we going to get these traces? Um, we need to keep our eyes open. <clears throat> we, what are we going to do about it? How are we going to mitigate that problem? Well, we heard about, a bit about the European Observatory, which has been around about 10 years now. Lucy Gleeson gave us a talk about the business plan for putting a, a research reactor in North Wales. It has a strong focus on molybdenum-99 production, but also allowance for uh, increasing uh, therapeutic radionuclide production. And of course, it's all about, and lots of speakers have said this word, advocacy. And Jed Young in particular get, gave a talk dedicated to this topic um, about the, the setting up of this organization called Radionuclides for Health UK, which is like um, a kind of clearinghouse for networks that have got, that are stakeholders uh, in producing radionuclides uh, in the UK. It's an international problem, it needs advocacy, and, and the, the advocacy and the networks need to be coordinated to get the best response. And um, Radionuclides for Health UK, led by Jen, has organized uh, stakeholder workshops in various areas, um, and I would suggest that if you are a stakeholder or member of a stakeholder group and you want to add your voice, Radionuclides for Health UK, and you can look it up on the web, is a key contact and do speak to Jen. So finally, just to summarize where I think we are from a scientific perspective, very much as we are with a clinical perspective, um, I, I'm so pleased to see the scientists coming back to the BNMS after many years. Uh, there's been more new science here than for, for a long time. We may be seeing the green shoots of some, some of research on Technetium 99M um, uh, radio tracers. Clearly there's a desire to bring advanced molecular radiotherapy to patients and along with that should be a new focus on radiobiology. We are preparing for total body PET, whether we know it or not. Some of the things were not directed to total body PET, but they certainly are very relevant. But we don't have total body PET in the UK yet. We're a bit behind, but it is coming. We're tooling up for it, and it's going to be a community resource, so it's worth everybody, even if you're not on a, on a site where there's likely to be total body PET, 
you will have something to say about it. So please do get involved. We don't have enough alpha emitters in the UK yet to do the therapy that we'd like to do. But again, as a community, we're working on that. And the key is advocacy uh, and getting the various networks and stakeholders to coordinate their advocacy. Many times we've heard that we don't have enough scientists or uh, people in general working on new therapies and associated biology. So uh, maybe the excitement that's, that's generated um, that is mu much bigger now in the last couple of years than it has been for a long time, maybe that will, uh, in, uh, will generate improved radionuclide availability and in turn bring more people into the field. Um, <clears throat> but at the moment we don't have enough trained staff and we need to work on this a, 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 in a serious way. Finally, if the next generations and the generations after that are going to benefit from all of this promise that we are seeing, there is another big challenge that we have to play our part in addressing, and that is um, shown by Laura Perry's talk on environmental sustainability in nuclear medicine. There's a lot we have to do to make nuclear medicine more sustainable and more climate friendly. Um, so please, have a, um, please take note of what Laura is suggesting, and maybe the BNMS needs to get involved in this and, and have a specific program. But I'm going to leave it there, and I thank not just the organizers, and, uh, but everybody uh, for, for a really great conference. It's, it's been the most scientifically exciting for ages. And I say to the scientists, please keep bringing your new preclinical and radiochemical science to the BNMS and talking to the clinicians. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Professor Blur, for a fantastic highlights lecture. Again, may we present you with a small token of our appreciation.